when we have conflict with that, that person? Wh what do we do? H how do we move through it in a way that not only can end up being peaceful, but transformative for everybody involved? And our guest today is going to help us do exactly that. Um, our guest today is Dr. Draven James, and she's the founder of Everyday Peace. She's an author, a motivational speaker, and her goal is to educate, empower, and inspire others to build the life of their dreams, no matter what shows up in their lives, the good, the bad, or the otherwise. Her journey began uh, on the poverty, in poverty on the south side of Chicago. Um, she had always dreamed of a career on stage, uh, been there <laughs> myself, and she ended up going on to um, earn her doctorate in pharmacy from Creighton University, and she's worked of as a pharmacist all of her adult life. I think she's also got some um, acting roles too, although it's not here in this particular bio. Uh, along with her medical career and theatrical, theatrical aspirations, she's always had a keen interest in personal development. Um, she read Norman Vincent Peale's The Power of Positive Thinking back in college, and it's transformed her life. And so she's gained a lot of insight and she wants to help others to gain that insight so that they can positively affect their life. Um, I would like to welcome our guest today, Dr. Draven James. Hi there. Hi, wonderful to be here. It's nice to have you here. Um, first of all, I have to ask, where do you live? I live in Maryland, in Baltimore, Maryland. Okay, um, because you've got just the slightest, slightest hint of an accent. And as somebody who used to live in Texas, it's like when there's like, at least the little bitty bit of a drawl, I think that I think South. Have you lived in the South or you've been lived in Mar Maryland all your life? No, I'm from Chicago. I've lived gosh, in, in Massachusetts most of my life oh, and in Maryland. Okay. Yeah. Well, I know you started in Chicago. Interesting because it sounds, it sounds almost like a, a drawl and you certainly don't have a Boston accent. I lived there for a while and it's, you know, it's something else. So, you know, and it's interesting because I'm, I'm in a play right now, so I practice accents for different things. So uh -huh. I just got cast in a role, so maybe I'm picking up that already. Oh, oh, <laughs> what role is it? I want to know. Yeah, so it's a, it's a play that has to do with opiate addiction. Oh, wow. So it's called, oh my gosh, I just forgot the name. That's okay. Part. That's okay. It's a new, new, new play that's coming out in Baltimore, uh -huh. and I just recently got cast. So. Oh, congratulations. I, I, I know what it's like to, to have that thespian bug. Um, you know, I've been there, done that. Okay, so Draven, it's I, I'm always fascinated by how somebody has gotten from you know where they started out to where they are now, and what inspires them to share. And I talked a little bit about that in your bio. Can you go into a little bit more detail about um, why it is you're showing up now in your life to help others? Oh my gosh, yes, and I, I'm fascinated about the same thing in people. What makes a person really want to do this type of soul type of work and, and help people? And I can say in my own life is because I look back and I think everything that has happened to me, through me, and for me can't just be for me. Right? Mm. It's got to be for somebody else to help another person. And I look over my own life, and you said earlier in my bio, I was born in the south side of Chicago right. with the poverty. And probably anybody who knew me, you know, gosh, in my youth, it would think, you put doctor in front of your name? What was it like, giving that away? <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's only because of all of the people that the universe strategically placed on my path and all those things that look like they were horrible, right? Like I wouldn't right. wish that on my worst enemy. Sure. And all of that came together. And, and these people and these situations helped me to produce something in my life that I, that brings me joy. And mm. I want to do that for somebody else. I want to be that person that says, hey, wait a second, what's going on with you? Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, that's not meant to stop you. Let it, me tell you, there's another way to see that. Right, right. And it's really inspiring when somebody has such a success story, because finding your way out of poverty isn't an easy thing. Um, my father was the youngest of 12 kids, um, grew up in the Depression. He, his family were migrant farm workers. And he was the only one to ever go to college and he made a life for himself. And so it's like, I have such admiration for people who can go from that poverty to living the American dream. Um, 
So why didn't you just stop at, you know, having a successful um, career in pharmacology? You know, as a pharmacist, you are helping others. You're, you're showing up and you, you've got your doctorate. Why have you shifted over into um, kind of motivational speaking? That's wonderful because, you know, it's just the opposite. Because I knew that I always wanted this career on the stage. And I wanted mm-hmm. to be on the stage because I just have this incredible creative energy inside of me. But I wanted to be there, honestly, because I felt some of the most peaceful moments in my life were when I was sitting in the theater or in, mm. you know, watching something play. And, and just the whole world stood still for me for a second. And everything that was plaguing me and, and making me um, feel less than faded into the background for a few minutes. And I wanted to do that for people. I wanted them to feel whole and complete. And, and I thought, gosh, I love literature. I love Shakespeare. I love this. This is how I'm going to do it. Uh-huh. So then, I so happened to be very good at math and science. I do not know how because I never liked math and science. Uh-huh. <laughs> but I was better at literature. But someone said to me, well, you know, you want to make money. You want to get out of the situation. You need to go to medical school. Right. And I thought, okay, well, you know, too dumb to doubt. I'll do it. And I got into the program the summer before I left to go to pharmacy school. My brother gave me the power of positive thinking by Norman Vincent Peale. And uh-huh. I said, whatever this guy just did in this book for me, uh-huh. that's what I want to do yeah. for somebody else. Right. And right then and there, at my first semester in pharmacy school, I said, I've made a drastic mistake. There's nobody here like me. Nobody mm-hmm. thinks like I do. Right. I'm not enjoying this. I know I can't spend the rest of my life on this end, helping people from here. It's right. taken a lot out of me. It's yeah. going to take too much. But I'm a commitment individual, if nothing else. Right, <laughs> right, right. So I was in, and I thought, I'll finish it out, and I'll just you know get through. I didn't realize at the time how much financial debt um, prior at the end of this process, I'm like, oh no, sure. I'm going to be here for a while. But during that whole process, I realized, gosh, I can help here too. Mm-hmm. And I kept studying everything that I thought resonated with what I, what my definition was at the time of peace. It's, it's evolved right. since then. But I thought, but this is what I want to have. This is what I want to do. And I kept studying that parallel to studying pharmacy school. And I can remember doing these little talks in pharmacy school. Sometimes I forget all this stuff, but I brought a sorority or fraternity in professional school that talked everything's a fraternity to my college that wasn't there. Uh-huh. And I, my platform speech was about, you know, this peace that resides inside of you. Now, this, I'm 18, 19 years old. Where did wow. this all come from? But this was <laughs> old soul. I was building my life. Uh-huh. I really believed that there was more than just this, that wherever you were, whatever you were doing, mm-hmm. you could still blossom and you could still bloom. And so nothing was going to take away this desire to be what I thought then was, you know, you know Norman Vincent Peale. Right. And so many, many years went by and I sort of put it on the back burner and a lot of other things happened in my life. You know, I got married and that situation was very, very traumatizing and had children and I kept resonating with these truth that I believe, this foundational truth about peace, which I use the definition of peace, of wholeness, completeness, nothing missing, nothing broken, totality. Mm-hmm. And I would go back to journals that I wrote when I was like so much younger and I would see, okay, I've evolved from here, but there are some foundational principles here that work. Uh-huh. And I would just start applying them to the situation. I said, this is bigger than me. Somebody has to be helped. I would start doing them in my pharmacy talks. I was a consultant. I would go around talking at different facilities to nurses and doctors primarily. Uh-huh. At the end of my talk, I would spend five minutes talking about you, the whole person, mm. outside of your career. And I got invited to be a keynote speaker. Not a big deal. I always did that for pharmacy. But they said in this invitation, you know, when you come out, don't talk about anything that has to do with pharmacy. Just that little peace thing that you do, that's uh, what you're supposed to be doing. And I thought, that's wow. Great. That's I'm great. Ready. And let me tell you, I had already been a pharmacist now almost 20 years. <laughs> uh-huh. Right. And but, so it took a while. And, and it's interesting because I don't know if you've looked at my bio, but I'm a former research statistician. I used to do apply statistics to various things. The last several years, I designed and analyzed clinical trials and cancer research. And then ultimately be, went into he, alternative healing and self empowerment. Um, and for me, Oh, gosh, probably, you know, five years before I ever 
stopped being a statistician. I knew that it wasn't connected to my heart, but I also knew that I was there for purpose. And it ultimately did serve me because it, it offered a certain type of legitimacy. You know, if I'm talking about alternative healing and I'm also, you know, if you Google me and go deep enough, you see that I've, you know, I'm a an co-author on, um, you know, peer-reviewed medical journal articles. So it's the sort of thing where sometimes we don't understand fully why we're where we're at. And yet, if it feels right, it's serving a purpose. And it sounds to me like what's happening with you is it's so inspirational because you're reaching people, medical professionals who need to hear about wholeness, who need to hear about peace. And so had you left a while ago, you wouldn't have had that opportunity. Absolutely. Right. So you bloom and you blossom where you're planted. Right. Oh, yeah. And and you and you know sometimes people who have a very scientific mind, right? uh-huh. and we're used to breaking things down. No, no, there's a scientific reason I can prove. And you get in that space, and you're so much in your head that you disconnect from your feelings mm. and from the, this universal energy that really would take you so much further than your mind could ever um, conceive of. And it's nice when you can, as you said, be on that level with them and say, "Oh, that's interesting. Have mm. you ever considered this?" Yeah, yeah. And then they're like, oh, you're a legitimate individual. You got the science background like Uh I do. So, uh you know, I can hear you. Yes, exactly. We have to go to a quick break, but stay tuned for more with Dr. Draven James. Welcome back to the Christine Eptrich Show here on KKNW and Transformation Talk Radio. You know, Draven, I know today we're going to focus on relationships And I think it's where most of our uh, shadow side comes to play. You know, the, 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 the difficult marriage, um, the long-term friendship that hits a, a sudden glitch, uh, the relationship we have with our children that can, that can really push our buttons. What is it about relationships that can foster more inner growth? Oh, I believe that life has three major categories, health, wealth, and relationships. And so every area that we're going to be challenged in is going to fall into health, wealth, or relationships. And so every area that we're going to need to grow in, health, wealth, and relationships, in order to have a balanced life, that's a happy life, right? Mm-hmm. Meet people, they have all the money that you could just, my mother used to say, shake a stick at it, right? right <laughs> so all right. this money's out there, right? And their health is not Mom had a friend who passed away um, from kidney disease, and he said to mm-hmm. me, that as much money as I have, okay, not that it's going to take away this rare disorder that I have. Mm-hmm. And then you have people, you see them all the time, but they'll have um, all this money, but they don't have their relationships in place. And they, not even a relationship with self. They're drug addicted and all these other things, trying to heal this hole in their heart. Right? Right. So right. relationships are part of that triangle, that sturdy triangle. Mm -hmm. And without having that intact relationship, all of the other things, you're still going to have this massive hole in the part of you that creates this peaceful existence. Mm -hmm. So those relationships, and the the major one being the earthly relationship with self, you know, how you relate to self Uh generates every other relationship. And I think that people often are looking externally, you know, playing the blame and shame game, playing the victim. Um, so they're, they're pointing their finger outward towards, um, you know, the circumstances in their life. Why is it we should be focusing inward? Yeah, that's so interesting because I say anatomy sort of sets us up for failure a little bit, right? Our two eyes point forward. Right. And so we believe that everything that these eyes see is the genesis of everything. It's like, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, I see this and this wasn't going right. So that's why I don't feel good inside. Uh-huh. If the eyes pointed inward, we realize that the genesis of everything is this internal relationship that we have. Mm-hmm. But it's so much easier for us to sit back and say, well, if you did this, or if you didn't do that, or if you behave like this, then this relationship would be better, or I would be happy. Mm-hmm. Instead of saying that maybe you acting this way or you not doing this is for me to turn inward and say, what is it that I need to change about me? Not with the end goal being to change you, right. but to grow me. And it could be, it could be, we don't like to hear this, but we could be mean that as I grow me, mm-hmm. this relationship will change. Mm-hmm. It will change. Yeah. And it may not exist in a way that is, has been comfortable for me for so many years, right? These titles may change. Right, right. And we are so 
resistant to change. We, we are. Our ego needs for things to be familiar, right? right. In order for us to, in order for the ego to feel safe. Mm-hmm. And you were talking about um, how you know we we really want peace. I'm thinking about all the people who love drama. Do you think, on some level, they really want peace? Well, then when you think about it, and peace, it, the definition that I use is wholeness, completeness, nothing missing, nothing broken, totality. Uh-huh. And so we would hate to say that. Oh, I love drama because I am totally opposite of that. I, I would uh-huh. take I just peace, serenity. Zen like and everything out, you know, people please are probably to the worst degree at some point in my life. But there are drama is part of it, right? right, right. You can't have a good movie, right? If it's like, okay, what's going to happen here? What, where's the twist? So there are those people in life who are just going to bring the spice, uh-huh. right? whether we like that or not. But that's part of the whole picture, right? It wouldn't be that's totality. They have their, like, a place in this life for them too, right? how much of their life, how much of the space in your life they need to take up, you have to determine that. Mm-hmm. Like, oh my gosh, you're so necessary, but maybe you don't need to exist like this in my life. Mm-hmm. Right. Have this major position. Maybe I need to redefine this relationship because I'm not ready for whatever the, the drama that you bring. Mm-hmm. So what, what I find so interesting is, um, you know, I was in a long-term marriage that was very difficult and after I did some really thorough healing, I recognized that it was time for me to leave. And I left as lovingly and as peacefully as possible. But it was, um, what's so interesting to me is for how long that old drama continued to to exist in my, my mind, you know, that it was like, I'd replay it over and over and, and try to make sense of it and struggle through it. Um, so even if somebody's not no longer in our life in the same way, or the, the relationship has changed, the old stuff can still take up residence in our head. What do we do about that? Yeah, because you're holding on, right? Yeah. What we do is, you know, it, it doesn't have to. That's actually a choice, but we don't realize it's a choice. I tell people that if we look at what happens to us, the body does the same thing, whether it's stressed and, and, and anxious or whether it's excited, right? Mm-hmm. The you know, cortisol levels do the same thing. Physiologically, it does the same yeah. thing, but we give it the meaning. We say, okay, now I'm stressed. Oh, now this is anxiety, right? right. Oh, now this is excitement, right? So we give it all these titles. But what, it, what these experiences are meant to do is just pass through us. Mm-hmm. We're not supposed right. to hold on to anything, but we hold on to it because the ego says, this is familiar. Mm. You don't like this, but it's familiar. Right. You know where all of the bodies that so to speak are hidden. You know, you know all the pitfalls. There's nothing new here. You're safe here because you know this room. Right. You know this pain. And so we can spend our time here without having to venture out again. Here comes that C word into something that's change, mm-hmm. right? Something right. that's unfamiliar. And that's what we do. Go we'll get out of a situation or, or even a situation could evolve. But we refuse to let that evolve because we're like, no, this is what I know about you. This right. is what I know about, you know, um, this relationship. And knowing this keeps me safe because there, you can't surprise me. Yeah. You can't surprise me. So we we have the choice. And I find myself in the same predicament, you know, when, when I lose consciousness and lose focus, mm-hmm. I'll go back to, oh, yeah, I remember how bad that hurt. Right, right. Instead of saying, oh, yeah, I remember when I couldn't see my way out of that. And look at what happened. Yeah, yeah. Look at what happened when I changed my focus. Right. Same situation, just different perspective. Yep. And and I think that um, it, it's interesting because for me, I've had many people kind of look at my relationship with my ex and, and think, you know, why have I maintained a positive relationship, you know? And, and you know, for several years, he was coming over to my house for um, holidays as well. So we could do the, you know, do the holidays together as a family. He's now remarried. So that's changed, but it's, it's the kind of thing where I, I had to let go along the way. But what was so interesting for me was um, the struggles that I felt and experienced and that took up residence in my, my mind for way too long had to do with why I'd put myself in that situation, which required looking back much further than, um, you know, when I was even married to him. So it's the kind of thing where that, that inner struggle can lead us to illumination, but ultimately the only way to move forward is to let go. Yeah. And you said something that's so, so important is that 
you realize, why am I going through this has really nothing to do with this, right? Mm-hmm. It has to do with some core beliefs, yeah. and which are probably tied. And, and I, you know, as a mom, you get these adult or young adult children and you look back and say, oh my gosh, now they are blaming me. Uh-huh. Like I blame my mom. This right. is not right. so good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but it's part of the process, right? So we all, we all realize no blame, no shame, no condemnation that we will not get out of childhood without something, mm-hmm. right? That helps sure. to shape us, right? right? And so we look back and say, hey, what were my core beliefs that allowed me to allow you to exist in my space for so long, behaving mm-hmm. that way? Right. right? And, we, and, I, and, and I speak for myself, too, because I've been in that same situation. I go back and I was telling somebody, I said, I realized that I believe somewhere in my, you know, they had come with this belief that things were going to be hard. They were just going to be hard. Didn't mean that I wasn't going to make it, but it was just going to be hard. Yeah. And so when relationships got hard, I accepted, well, you know, I know it's going to be hard. Mm-hmm. And yeah. when it got to be unbearable, well, that's just another form of hard. And that's, you know, I didn't realize that, okay, this is a cue. I'm telling you to exit. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> this is a great conversation. Uh, we have to go to a break, but when we return Let's talk about how we can take conflict. Instead of avoiding conflict or staying in conflict, how can, we can take that conflict and transform relationships. Stay tuned for more with Dr. Draven James. Welcome back to the Christine Uptrick Show on 1150 AM KKNW. I am talking to Dr. Draven James. She's the author of Freedom is Your Birthright, and she's a motivational speaker and a pharmacist and an actress. Um, and who knows what else she's going to create through her life. Yeah, I, I love people, Draven, who are, I don't think multitasking is the right way to put it, but who, who have different aspects of themselves they like to express in a variety of ways. So they might be an artist and a mathematician, or you know, you've know, you got the, the acting and the motivational speaking along with pharma, pharmacology, you know, being a pharmacist. So... Um, why is it that we should want to express ourselves fully? Yeah, it, because this is who you, each of, each of us came to the universe with something to share. And quite often we don't share because we are so afraid of conflict, right? We don't, I don't want, or we don't want to be in the situation where people are looking at you and judging you. We don't want that. The ego can't take that really in our immature state. Hold, hold, but, hold on a sec, Draven. We're, we're getting a little bit of, um, can you speak louder? We're getting. Oh, if, yeah. Can you guys hear you know, me now? We're we're having a little technological issue. I'm gonna um, let Nathan do his thing over there, and um, I'm gonna go ahead and talk on my own here for a moment uh, as we get Draven back on, and we're gonna try to get that sound quality better. Uh, you know, 2020 is a new year, and I want to tell everybody that I've. Signed on for another year on KKNW and Transformation Talk Radio. I'm really excited about that. Uh, you know, it's funny because I know we've got some loyal listeners out there, and I really appreciate you. And I do this because I I get such a kick out of it, and I know that our conversations can help people. I've heard from people who say, you know, I oh that that interview was really interesting, or it applied to my life in this way. Um, and I just want to say that. We love to hear from our listeners. So if you ever have anything to say about the show or a particular guest, a particular show, um, please email us, info at christineupchurch.com or, you know, make a comment on the Facebook page. It's Christine Upchurch Professional Page. And uh, please like us if, if you've enjoyed any interviews. And um, yeah, that's very helpful for us. So it looks like Nathan is still working. And I have to tell you, got some exciting stuff coming up um, on uh, uh, this coming year. And I'm going to be teaching something I've never taught before. uh, And I'm really excited about that. But I'm going to just like leave that as a teaser because we have Draven back. Is that right? Okay, I'm not hearing her. Oh, I'm here. I'm hearing you guys. I thought you were talking to the sound engineer. (laughs) Great, great. Okay, nice to have you back. And that sounds better. Yay. You were like cutting in and out for some reason. Oh, okay. Yeah. We had some rain here. So I don't know if that's what's doing it. Well, you know, if we have rain here all the time and <laughs> I'm not sure that rain's a good excuse. 
Okay. You were talking a little bit about conflict. Yeah. Um, and so, um, and we're talking about expressing ourselves fully and, and, and you had sort of moved into conflict. Right. Because that is another C word, right? We got change, we got conflict uh-huh. and expression requires us to enter or as our authentic self, right? right? Right. Not worrying about protecting yourself. And so much of our existence when we're existing in our ego state is about protecting ourselves. And so we don't want to show up as our true self because how are you going to feel about that? And what if I use the wrong words? And uh-huh. what if it doesn't come out right? And this whole thing of being afraid of conflict yeah. prevents us from showing up as ourselves and being a truly expressive and robs the universe of what we have to give. Right. right, because we're looking for perfection, which doesn't exist in ourselves. It doesn't exist in anyone else. And when we accept that and say, you know what, I'm going to give you my authentic self right now, mm-hmm. realizing that I got room to evolve. Right, right, and I got space to grow and to be forgiving and to be forgiven and live in that space. That takes a lot of courage. There's more C words. They were all we see: <laughs> change, conflict, and courage. Yeah. Well. But when I think about conflict, I, I think about um, a lot of dysfunctional conflict, the, the blame and shame game, the um, looking at somebody as being wrong. It's like this black, or black and white situation as opposed to looking at the gradation of grays. Um, how can we take conflict and turn that into something transformational? If we use conflict, again, take these eyes that point outward and point it inward and not inward in a way where we're looking to blame ourselves because that, that can go wrong that way if we're not using skillfulness when we do this. We'll look inside and say, where are the areas where I can grow? Uh-huh. Right? And, not, and for me to grow doesn't mean that I have to be wrong. It just means that I'm still alive and I still can evolve. Uh-huh. And I'm not looking to make someone else wrong. Each of us own our space on the planet. And so, you know, I tell my kids, this are my famous phrase is everyone gets ready for what they're getting ready for at different phases in their life. So uh-huh. just because you're ready to hear the truth about this doesn't mean the other person is. And that's right. quite OK. Yeah. Right? But when we turn inward, it allows us to say, you know what, I'm in a situation where I feel stifled by whatever's going on here. You know, conflict uh-huh. generally means that we believe there's not enough of something. One of us is going to get the short end of the stick. Uh-huh, right. But when we, re- we realize that, no, I got my own stick inside of me. I got the whole enchilada inside of me. You mm. got the whole enchilada inside of you. And what I choose to do with this situation is to turn inward and say, hey, this is an area where I'm annoyed about something. Now, what about me is annoyed about that? Mm-hmm. Oh, my goodness. That area that has these core beliefs, I need some attention so that I can feel whole, so that I can feel complete, mm-hmm. irregardless of whether or not we ever agree on this point. It's not really about that. Uh-huh. So what do you do when you're trying to be introspective about it and trying to share from an authentic space and you've got somebody who is in conflict with you and they're being abusive in one way or another? Abu- boundaries are important. You know, we can have this conversation on so many levels, but we just bring it down to this physical space and say, you, each of us has a right and obligation to protect the, make protective boundaries. Sure. And that's when we say to ourselves, right now in this state, it may be best that we create some healthier boundaries. Where maybe this is not a conversation that we can have, right? Mm-hmm. Or maybe the, you know, we need to change the dynamics of this relationship. Maybe we need to give each other some space where we're not around. So that physicalness has to be there. And, you know, there are so many ways to be abused and manipulated. Mm -hmm. And I've been in a lot of those situations where I know that I have to say, you know what, in order for me to get to a level where I can deal with what's going on inside of Trayvon, Uh I've got to make some boundaries, some healthy boundaries. Right. Right. That's a a clear first step. Yeah. To make sure that we're not in these abusive situations. And I think that, um, we're socialized, particularly females in the society, are socialized to be nice and to to say yes to way too much. Um, so I think I agree that the boundaries are so so important. And in fact, um, Brene Brown's research shows that the most compassionate people 
also happen to be the, the most boundaried people. So those people who have great compassion have also have really strong boundaries. Right. There's a story that she tells in one of her books that I think about a lot. She says she said yes to some conference and, you know, then they told her, said, okay, well, you're going to be sharing a room. And she says, well, you know, inside of herself, she knew that I kind of need my downtime. I can't uh-huh. you know, be on and then be, I need some downtime, but she didn't have the courage at the time to say, you know, can't do that because they kind of shamed her and said, are you saying that you're too good <laughs> for your room? Right. And I think about that and saying that, you know, you every decision that I need to make for the best part of me to be present mm-hmm. may not be something that sits well with you. But ultimately, ultimately, I have to be good to Drayvon. You have to be good to you yeah. because I can give you my best when I'm in a situation that serves me. And when you can give your best when you're in a situation that serves you, and that's when we have to be really adult about it and say, okay, you need me to do this, and my answer has to be no. Uh-huh. Whether and, you can accept that lovingly or not, that is the answer. Yeah, and I think that one of the important parts of setting healthy boundaries is to do it in a way where we're not reacting it from a place of victimhood, like, how dare you tell me I have to share a room? But instead of saying, you know, instead of saying something like, um, that doesn't work for me. And, um, and, if, and, and so we need to make other arrangements, kind of like, it's just where my boundary is and let's fix it according to my boundary. But so oftentimes I think when we get to boundary setting, we start to get reactive and we're st- first starting to learn to say no, kind of like, you feel like a victim and no, don't do that, you know, or I can't do that. You know, I, I can't believe you're asking me to do that. Right, because we don't know how to fit it in, right? It's like you're in a toddler or something. You don't know exactly, well, do I fit it in by coming in really weak and asking for some sympathy? Or do I fit it in by coming really in really aggressive? Uh-huh. Instead of just coming in authentically and saying, that really doesn't work for me. And I, I, and I like to use, take the word really out. I don't know how that snuck in there, but that doesn't work for me. Mm-hmm. Is there something else that we can do? Yeah. And being totally prepared for the other person to say no and say, well, well maybe next time. Right. We're exactly. afraid that there'll never be a next time, but this is it. Yeah. And that attachment gets in the way. And we'll talk more about that on the other side of the break. So stay tuned for more. Welcome back to the Christy Neptune Show here on KKNW and Transformation Talk Radio. By the way, Nathan is behind the boards today. He's doing all the producing stuff. Um, Benny is out today. And Nathan, you've been doing a great job. Thank you so much for being here. And Draven, before we go any further with this wonderful conversation, I want to make sure our listeners get a chance to know how they can connect with you and what you've got going on. What's your website? My website is www.drdravonjames.com. And that's D-R-D-R-A, B like victory, O-N, james.com, drdravonjames.com. And my email address, I love to get that too because people do email me and I love reading emails info at drdravonjames.com. Right now we have a marvelous thing going on, which I'm so excited about because I believe totally that our life moves in the direction of our focus and focus is so very important. So we're doing a 2020 clarity challenge in the beginning of the new year. And if you email me, I'll give you all the details on that. You can also find it on my website, but it's 2020 clarity challenge. It's an absolutely free challenge that we're offering in January. And so it's leading into this beautiful program called The Brilliant Life. The Mm. Brilliant Life. Can you imagine waking up and saying, oh my gosh, my life is brilliant. (laughs) Oh, yes. And uh, I love my life. And and I know that um, for many people, though, they wake up and they're not happy in in their lives. Um, You know, I have moments where I'm not happy with the state of the world. But in terms of my own personal life, I'm, you know, I, I just feel such joy and gratitude. And I know that this time of year, people are assessing where they're at, you know, are, are they going the direction they want to go? Can they shift things? I think that you're talking about how people don't like to change, or at least ego doesn't like change. And yet people really do want positive change. It's, it's something that they're, they're longing for. They want it. They want they want the change, but they all, you know, it's like wanting to move forward, but stand in the same place, right? Right. Because when, to change means that we are changing. There are some things that are here that are going to change in your life and maybe not be here anymore. And mm-hmm. that is the frightening part of, for people. It's like, okay, in order to get, 
you know, from the thing, from the relationship that's painful mm-hmm. to the relationship that's beautiful and, and fulfilling. Yes, it would be lovely if this relationship changed, but it may, the whole picture may change. The people, the players may change. Right, right. And that is the challenging part. How to have, how to still be happy during this transformational period. Mm-hmm. It's funny it. because the image that came to mind um, for me is I think that people often think that change um, requires struggle. I, 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 what came to mind was walking through an airport and having to walk to another gate really far away, you know, having to maybe even run with your luggage to try to get there on time for your flight, and how they have these people movers that you can just sort of step on and they move for you. Um, I really think that that change, although it can be painful at times, we can grieve losses sometimes. I think that if we step onto the right track, so to speak, the right path, that there is some ease involved. What's your perspective? Oh, you, you said that so poetically and so clear and simple at the same time. That is absolutely right. Like the universe supports us during our change period if we would allow it, right? Mm-hmm. It's us and our humanness, and especially in the ego, that brings the struggle with it. Right. it says, and, and, and that's part of your core belief, because that used to be my core belief, that this is going to be hard. Mm-hmm. You know. And on the tail end of that, I had, but don't worry about it, you'll make it. But I never had to have that core belief that said, this is going to be hard. Right. This is going to be different. We're going to change, and we're going to have a great time doing it. We're going to meet some wonderful people around, along the way. And when I look back, and most people probably can attest to this, when I look back over my journey in my life and I'm in the space of gratitude, I can see the sprinkling of all these wonderful people that showed up, that were people movers for me that held my hand yeah. and said, Trayvon, this is the way. Oh, right. Trayvon, right here. And it's so beautiful, and that relationship building. Yeah. It's where you have your focus, right. is what your core beliefs are. If you know like you know that I want to get from here to there, whether it's a relationship or change your health, change mm-hmm. your diet, change uh-huh. your um, employment, whatever it is, if you know like you know that the universe is going to support you and there are going to be people movers all along that pathway, then you move with a smile. Mm-hmm. But if you believe, well, this is going to be hard, right. then you're going to be stuck. Yeah. And move slower struggle. than what you should have. Right. And be knocking on doors that shouldn't be opened. And, and yeah, been yeah, there, right. done all that. And Me too. Uh, <laughs> I love the people movers personally. <laughs> yes. Yes. Right? This much, we can do this the easy way or we can do this the hard way. Yes. 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 So, do you have a final message for our listeners today about um, how to approach relationships in a way that, um, can allow us to transform ourselves and the relationships? I certainly do. Focus is king. So focus on what's working. Focus on what's working. That, and become grateful for that. That gratitude allows you to see what's not working, what needs to change mm-hmm. in a softer, more uh, solution-oriented way. So tell tell me a little bit more about, can you give us an example of that? What do you, what do you mean by oh, how gratitude plays into that? Yeah, so gratitude is everything because when you when you have gratitude, you bring into that, that energy, right? So you draw more energy of things to be grateful for. So uh-huh. it's a relationship. Let's just say we're having a relationship problem and the, the problem is, oh, there's, you know, this individual blows the money. They're not responsible with the money. But what's really great about them is they're very generous. Mm. So you focus on that generosity and that yeah. great quality. And that allows you to even have the conversation about the, the issue here right. from a different space. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, there was a simple technique that I started using when I was like 18 years old, with, you know, the sandwich technique. Everybody knows that you say, you say what's working and you say what needs work. And then at the end you say, and I really love the fact that, you know, that we were able to have a kind of relationship where we could talk about this. Yeah. Right? When I, when I've managed other people, um, that's, that's always the approach I took. Yes, it's, it's taking a lot of heat now. Like I read articles that say they don't like it so much, but I can tell you 24 years I've been, um, you know, in a relationship, uh, 30 years practicing as a pharmacist. I always use that. And if it doesn't work for the other person, it mm-hmm. always works for me, right? right? Because I'm right. the person who's courageous enough to say the hard stuff. Right. And having to say it in the space of love and gratitude makes yeah. it easier for yeah. me to say it. Yeah. Right. So if the other person is getting confused, I read these articles that said, oh, it's quite confusing. If you just want to bring a negative message, bring a negative message. Well, sometimes it's hard for people to do that, to just come out and just be, you know, that hard about something. And there's always something to be grateful for, right. even in the worst of situations. And, and it needs to become from a place of true gratitude as opposed to like, I'm just going to 
sweeten the negative news here, you know, by sandwiching in, you know, between a couple of, you know, a little flattery. And so it has, so I think that sometimes the timing and where, where we're coming from personally has to be this place of, of love and acceptance of the other person as a human being um, before telling them negative, the, the, right. the, the negative feedback. Right. And that plays into the part of knowing thyself, right? So we know ourselves. We know that there are parts of ourselves that are just wonderful. Then there are the other parts of ourselves that we're trying to improve on. Yeah. And that, and we see that in ourselves, it's easier to say, you know what, this person really irks me in this way, but I see this genuine quality in them that is marvelous. Mm -hmm. And pointing that out helps you as the sayer of the thing right. and helps them be able to receive it better. So when you're talking about healing a damaged relationship, coming from this place of being Focusing on what's working in that individual yeah. allows you to really speak clearly on what's not working from a place of love. Yeah. yeah. And being being accepting of whatever the outcome is. Don't already have a pre, you know, I want to keep things the same. Uh -huh. Nothing is to be remain the same. It, 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 it either it evolves one way or the other. It right. evolves. And again, we get back to that attachment issue. We have to let go of our attachment to outcome in order to be on that people mover, so to speak. Yes. Love the journey and let the universe does, do its job with the outcome. Mm, yeah. Drayvon, this was a wonderful conversation. I want to thank you for joining us here today. And I want to mention your website again, drdravonjames.com, uh, D-R-D-R-A-V-O-N, james.com. Thanks, Drayvon. Thank you. And thank you for joining us here today. I always enjoy um, sharing the wisdom of others and sharing my own wisdom with you. And I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks so much for tuning in today. If you'd like to empower yourself to step further into your vibration of change, please visit my website at christineupchurch.com where you can learn more about my insights, upcoming events, and private sessions. Thank you.